I'm the uh, CEO of Police Strategies, uh, and uh, we're uh, uh, a company that that works with. Uh, we're currently working with about 100 agencies in eight states, and we help law enforcement agencies collect, analyze, and report on their data, mostly use of force data. And uh, a bit of background: I was a, a prosecutor in King County, Washington, uh, in the 1990s, and then I worked for several years in the Seattle Mayor's office as a public safety policy advisor. Uh, then I moved to the city attorney's office, and um, I was there in 2011 when the Department of Justice came in and did their pattern of practice investigation of Seattle PD. Um, that led to a consent decree that the department's still under, and uh, the mayor appointed me to be the compliance coordinator to oversee uh, some of the reforms in the department. Um, I left uh, the department in 2014 and formed police strategies with some former colleagues from Seattle PD, and we wanted to focus on some of the lessons learned from the consent decree. And the main one was that nobody knows anything about use of force because there's no data. Um, and so so everybody's, you know, all these policies and training programs was really not evidence-based because there's no data to, to really support any of it. So it's sort of whatever people think is the right thing to do. So we really wanted to focus on use of force. And the problem with use of force is that because there's no data, you you, you essentially have to create your own database. And so what I'd like to do is to sort of show a PowerPoint um, that gives you, let's see if I can share my screen here, 31 million, stop, tell me an arrest. So, so this is our estimate of the 400,000 uses of force. Um, nobody knows what the exact number is, but based on the 100 agencies that we have data on, uh, about 4% of all arrests result in a use of force. And this is because the suspect either uh, fled or threatened the officer or resisted arrest or assaulted the officer. Um, and then um, about 50% of all uses of force result in some level of injury. And most of these injuries are relatively minor bruises, scrapes, or, or minor cuts. Um, and then there are about 1,100 to 1,200 deaths a year. This really hasn't changed much over the last 20 years, despite all the reforms and consent decrees, et cetera. Um, and and then of the 1,100 um, deaths, about two percent or less than two percent are found to be unjustified or excessive, and the officers are are typically prosecuted uh, in these instances. Um, we also obviously don't know how many uh, canine bites there are uh, nationally, uh, because as far as I know, may, maybe you know if there's data, but I, I'm not aware of any data source on that. But based on the age and obviously not all agencies have canine units um but the the hundred agencies that we have a lot of them have canine units the larger agencies some of the smaller agencies do not but this is a very rough estimate based on our data is we think that there's between 15,000 and 25,000 uh canine bites uh nationally um does anybody have any feedback on whether i think that number sounds about right It depends on where you got that number I, for me. Well, it, this is my, uh, the, the way I got this number is looking at the, uh, obviously we only have, there are 18,000 agencies and we only have data on 100 agencies, um, uh, both large and small agencies. And so um, based on what we've seen about how often canines are used with those agencies, um, if we assume that 400,000 uses of force annually, we estimate that there's about 15,000 to 25,000 bytes. But again, this is a super rough estimate. Um, again, the, the big problem is there is no national and very little state data on uh, police use of force. Um, in 2015, the federal government launched a police data initiative to try to sort of fill the data gap. Um, only 127 agencies participated and they basically just sent random data sets to the federal government and these are posted online, but there's no way, for example, on the use of force data sets, there are only 28 agencies that submitted use of force data and each data set was different. So there's no way some data sets only had four variables, some had 20 variables, but there's no way to compare the data. It's just a bunch of random numbers, basically. Um, in 2019, the FBI launched their National Use of Force Data Collection, 
And this is only data for death, serious bodily injury, or discharge of a firearm. So a relatively small number of cases. Um, but the good thing about the database is that it collects a lot of different data variables, including um, if the suspect posed a threat. Um, so this, there was a lot of promise in this database because right now the only data we have on deadly force comes from crowdsourced like, uh, and media reports. Um, so the problem is, is that the FBI um, is refusing to release any of the data. So even though this database was collected for public use, the FBI is refusing to release the data and they're using it as an excuse that not all agencies are participating. So about between six and 8,000 agencies report to the database um, and the FBI is just simply refusing to release the data. I actually submitted a FOIA request and they for the data and they denied my request. I appealed, I won my appeal. And then they said it would take five or six years to give me the data. Um, so they're just, uh, it's just ridiculous. Uh, and it's such a valuable information that doesn't exist anywhere else. And it's collected for public use and yet they're refusing to release it. But what they did do uh, is release, they, they released four sort of tables and graphs and they didn't say what the numbers were. They didn't say what the percentages were but they, they gave these rankings and, and they did this in 2022. And so uh, th th they had the most frequent categories. And again, we don't know what the numbers are. We don't know if this is based on a thousand cases, a hundred cases, 10,000 cases, we just don't know. But they gave this ranking. And what's interesting is, is that if you just, th th there are a few media reports when they release this inf information. And so, what this makes it look like is the most common uh, use of force by police is a firearm, which is actually the least common use of force. But because they're only collecting data on firearms and serious bodily injury, of course, it's going to in discharge of a firearm. Of course, it's going to be number one. Uh, and canines ended up being number four. But again, we don't know what the numbers are. They're just giving these rankings. Um, and then they also gave rankings for uh, uh, resistance encountered. So again, it's just completely confusing, useless, uh, a waste of time and money. Um, and I always tell agencies, you know, if you're reporting to the system, you're just wasting your time because the FBI is never going to release the data. <clears throat> and not even agent agencies can't even get their own data. Nobody can get the data. Um, so I want to shift now to our, our force analysis system. Um, so because there is no, um, database a comprehensive database out there even with individual agencies we have to create our own database and the best source of information for that data are the incident reports and officer narrative statements because obviously when an officer uses force they're going to have to document everything that happened from start to finish from the time they arrived on the scene until until they booked the suspect into jail and so we actually it's a very labor intensive process, time consuming process, but it's the only way to do it. Um, and so we actually review the incident reports themselves. Uh, sometimes we'll review body cam footage, but most of the time it's just based on the officer's narrative statements. And we extract up to 150 different data fields uh, through various processes um, from, those, uh, from those reports. And then we produce a series of dashboards uh, both for internal use by the department and external use by the public. Um, the public dashboards don't include individual officer information, but the internal dashboards do. So agencies can use the, the dashboards, and we also do written reports to essentially do a risk assessment of all their use of force, look at individual officer behavior, uh, evaluate their policies and their training, um, and it gives them a very comprehensive look at all their use of force incidents. And we typically, when we start working with an agency, we'll typically code three to five years of historical data so you can immediately start looking at trends and patterns uh, in your use of force practices. Um, and so when, when we examine a use of force incident, it's not enough just to count the number of times a canine bites or the number of times a taser is used. You have to understand the context of each use of force incident. So we need to know what happened before the officer decided to use force. Uh, 
Uh, we need to know uh, all the dynamics back and forth between the officer and the suspect in terms of force and resistance. And then we need to know what happened after force was used in terms of injuries and what, what the subject was charged with and what their restraints were used. And we need to look at things at the incident level uh, so all the date, time, location, the suspect level, the demographics of the suspect, threat, resistance, et cetera, and then officer information. And we, we, we gather as much information as we can on the officers, including their age, race, and gender, their assignment, their years of experience, um, training, et cetera. So there's a wealth of information on all these different things in the database. Um, and the heart of our system is our uh, uh, force analysis. And these are sort of legal algorithms that we developed to analyze each use of force incident under the Graham v. Connor standard. Now, obviously, every agency and some states may have their own use of force standards, uh, but nothing can go below Graham v. Connor. Um, so that is the, the floor by which all use of force is judged. Um, and so it gives us a way to uh, uniformly analyze all these different use of force from large and small agencies in different states and so forth. So it's, it's obviously an objective reasonableness standard. So we're looking at the use of force incident from the perspective of an objectively reasonable officer. So what did the officer know and what was the officer facing at the time the officer made the decision to use force? Um, and so we look at two different factors. We look at the, the justification uh, and then we look at the force factor, which examines the proportionality of force to resistance. So with the justification score, we take the four Graham factors, and that's the severity of the crime, the threat to the officer, others, the maximum level of resistance, and whether the suspect fled. <clears throat> and for each of those factors, we code it on a scale of zero to six. And again, this is based on the officer's narrative statements. And then we add them together for a score of zero to 20. Um, so if an officer used force and there was no crime, no threat, no resistance, and no flight, uh, then that case would get a justification score of zero. And then if, if that case was ever challenged in court, uh, based on what the officer said, it would be found to be unjustified because the officer did not articulate any reason under the Graham standards to use force. Um, we typically don't see any zeros, and when we do see zeros, it's usually because of poor report writing. Um, now, the higher the score, the more likely it is that a case uh, would be found to be justified, and the lower the score, the higher the risk to be unjustified. But there's no magical cutoff about uh, you know a five or above is justified and a, a four below is is unjustified. It just gives you a relative risk score. Um, for each incident. And once you once you get these scores together and you start comparing incidents and officers, you can see that there's a, a dramatic difference in how uh, officers, even within the same department, use force. Um, and even though most use of force is found to be within policy, within that 98 plus percent of, of, of a justified force, uh, there's a wide range in how officers use force. And so agencies can start to look at their very high performing officers that are using force appropriately and very effectively um, and start to find out what what characteristics those officers have and training, et cetera, to try to move the other officers into um, that category. The other thing that we look at is a force factor analysis. And this was actually developed by uh, Professor Jeff Alpert at the University of South Carolina in the 1990s. And all it does is it looks at the proportionality of force to resistance. So we code the level of force, the maximum level of force an officer uses on a scale of one to seven. And we, we also code the resistance level on a scale of one to seven. And then we sub subtract the force level from resistance level. And so uh, we, we code a canine, uh, any, any canine bite is um, a less lethal weapon. And that would include obviously tasers, batons, et cetera. Um, and so if you had a canine bite, that's a level six force against a suspect who was just hiding under a bed or something and only verbally or passively resisting, that would be a six minus two, which is a plus four force factor, which is relatively high. Um, compare that with an officer who may be striking a suspect or doing a takedown and the suspect is striking them back. That would be a five minus five, which is a zero directly proportional force to resistance. 
Now, a high force factor doesn't automatically mean it's excessive. It just means it's, it's at higher risk of being found to be excessive. Um, so we're not making, we're not changing an, uh, an agency's determination. Uh, each agency has already determined whether or not uh, force is within policy or not. All we're doing is allowing the agency to step back and look at all their force incidents, um, both uh, justified and unjustified or in or out of policy, and then look at the full picture of all the officers and see where their risk areas are. And then uh, finally, uh, and this is all just to sort of uh, uh, set up Andrew and John to, sh to show how we collect the data. And then they took our, our data and did the analysis for the, for the paper. Um, but this is something that the, the paper focuses a lot on, uh, which are force sequences. Um, <clears throat> and because use of force is not just a static event, it's a very dynamic back, there's a lot of back and forth usually between the suspect and the officer. And so what we want to do is to try to capture um, uh, that dynamic using four sequences. So each time we code up to six sequences on each use of force incident. And for each sequence, uh, we look at the force that was used and the resistance uh, that was presented. And we give it a force factor score for each sequence and then a force factor for the entire one. So this, this particular example, I'll just walk through a typical scenario. So the first sequence, each time the dynamic changes, we code a new sequence. So the first sequence is the officer says, uh, put your hands behind your back, and the suspect just stands there and refuses. So that's the first sequence, a lawful order, and then verbal or passive resistance. So that's a level two force, level two resistance, a zero force factor. So the officer grabs the suspect's arms, a level four force, and the suspect swings around and strikes the officer in the face. Uh, so that's an act of physical resistance. So that's actually a negative force factor, a negative one, because the suspect is using one level of force high, or resistance higher than the level of force. So then the officer takes the suspect down to the ground and the suspect turtles up uh, and doesn't pull out his arms. Uh, so that's a, a five minus one, which is a plus one force factor. And the officer then takes out his taser, uses it in drive stun and uh, to get the suspect's arms out. So that's a, a plus two force factor. Um, so um, the overall, we have a maximum force more force of six and a maximum resistance of five. So overall for this incident, um, there's a plus one force factor. So the, the four sequences give you an, a, a sort of a, a sense of number one, how long it took uh, the officers to, to control the suspect and, and sort of, um, uh, even though there's not a timestamp on there, it, it, if something goes to five or six sequences, the officers are having a real difficult time controlling the suspect. And usually cases that go to five or six sequences result in both injury to officer and the suspect. So it's generally best for officers to resolve a use of force incident within three sequences. Um, and officers that can do that consistently are usually using the most effective force, or they may be using overwhelming force, which may be a good, uh, you know, so it could be a good thing or a bad thing if an officer has a, a low number of sequences. So you also have to look at, at injury rates, et cetera. Um, but this is, uh, this is sort of the setup um, for, uh, for John and Andrew to talk about the results of the paper. Um, I don't know if, if, if uh, you wanna take any questions now or just, just at the end. Um, it's, uh, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, is it better to wait till everybody's done? Um, either way is fine. I, I, if there are any pressing questions about, um, uh, what I just presented, I'm happy to answer them or we can just go into the, is there to any, the paper. Anybody have questions? I don't I, have a question. I, I, I I'd actually question. like to hear the presenters. Uh, Bill, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, um, is there a, a definition that you use or is there a universal definition that you are using to define serious bodily injury? Um, we don't we don't uh, define serious bodily injury. What we do is we we have um, nine levels of injury, um, uh, starting with a complaint of pain. So so we don't. Uh, we try not to make any sort of judgment calls about, uh, and, and we don't we don't um, base our coding on any particular policy. Um, so, for example, we have um, 
complaint of pain, and then we have a taser probe injury, and then we have bruise and scrapes, and then we have minor cuts, uh, and then we have um, uh, chemical, you know, OC, uh, and then we have a canine bite, and then we have broken bones, and then we have a gunshot wound, and then we have death. And so, so we're just basically taking the the information that's in the officer narrative statement, and we're assigning a numerical value to it. Uh, but we're not saying, oh, this is serious bodily injury, and this is not. And just to follow up on that, does the FBI use a definition so that they're able to establish these incidents? So the FBI is only collecting data on uh, deadly force incidents, the discharge of a firearm, and serious bodily injury. And so the problem with that is that even though they do have a definition of serious bodily injury, um, I expect that, that, I don't know for sure, but I expect that different agencies will report different incidents to the FBI because they're, they're making their own decision as to whether or not it meets the definition of serious bodily injury, as opposed to saying, okay, if you have any broken bones, uh, we want those reported, or if you, I mean, because they do say if there's any death or a gunshot wound or a discharge of a firearm. So those are pretty easy, but the serious bodily injury can get a little squishy. Okay, thank you. Okay, I will stop sharing and turn it over to John and Andrew. All right, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. Can you guys see the the PowerPoint? Yes. yes. Right. Great. 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 All right. So I guess we'll just start with a little bit of an introduction. And so my name's Andrew Krajewski. And so I'm an assistant faculty member here at the University of Texas at Dallas. Um, I joined two or three years ago at this point. And most of my research interests really concern aggressive behavior. And then through my uh, working with John, I started studying police. And so, John, if you wanted to introduce yourself. Oh, I think he's muted. Uh, all right, I don't know. He might be coming over to my office, but we can get started, and then he can introduce himself at the end so we don't uh, spare time. OK, so working with Bob and John, we proposed a question where we were looking at basically interplay between subject resistance and subject threat, where a lot of the academic literature, at least, has really emphasized this idea of resistance. And so even in Bob's presentation, it was primarily about, um, you know, how much did the subject resist relative to the officer's level of force? But as uh, Bob's kind of data set shows, there's a lot of things going on um, that is in addition to resistance, right? Maybe subjects are communicating some level of uh, dangerousness. You know, maybe they have the means of committing uh, more harm to people, right? And that's not actually captured in the resistance. And so what this project really looks at is that interplay. And so just as a quick example, so we can think of resistance and threat as obviously linked concepts, but they are still quite distinct. So we can think of something where it's low resistance, low threat, almost like a, um, if you were to imagine, a relatively straightforward traffic stop, right? Where an officer pulls someone over for a speeding ticket, they take the ticket, the person doesn't communicate any level of threat, um, and it's pretty routine business. But then we can think of things where people are highly resistant, but they're still experiencing or they're still exhibiting low threat. So, you know, I guess as a hypothetical example, like a, a college party where individuals are drinking, right? And they're heavily intoxicated. They may be physically resistant where maybe they're not um, listening to the officer's commands, um, but there's no real reason to think that they are in a threat to themselves or to other people at the time. And then if we kind of go down to the threat side of things, we can think of low resistance, but high threat may just be carrying a weapon, right? Because a weapon communicates, um, or at least it carries the capacity to cause harm, regardless of what the individual is doing, right? If we kind of compare it to not having a weapon. And then we can think of kind of both situations, right? Where someone has a high level of threat and they're communicating an intent to resist, or they are actively resisting, right? And so these kind of two dimensions really shows uh, a lot of 
uh, like the importance of context and how many uh, like variations there can be in uh, officers' decision making, just depending on this, what the subject is doing, the nature of the situation, and things like that. And so, using police strategies data set, we really wanted to examine the relationship between subject threat and officer force, net of subject resistance, right? So what is driving officers to use force? And more specifically, what is driving them to escalate their use of force? Um, is it this idea that they're only responding to what subjects are actively doing to resist arrest? Or are officers kind of taking in the broader contextual kind of framework, right? And so, up until this point, I haven't really defined threat. It's, it's been very ambiguous in some ways. And so we use um, a relatively new definition of threat in the literature, which is a multidimensional interpretation defined as ability, which is the capacity to cause harm, intent, which is the subject's apparent desire to cause harm or to continue resisting. And then we have something called opportunity, where opportunity is simply the ability for the subject to actually enact and act on their ability and in their intent, right? So it's these three factors, these three dimensions that we can use to better understand what is threat. And as you'll see, right, these three things, although they're related to resistance, it's really a perceptual process where officers are going to have to make a judgment call as to how much ability does the person have? Do they suspect a weapon? Do they suspect um, that this person could cause physical harm. And then intent, I think it, that is even more the case, right? What differentiates, what signals do officers use to say this person has the intent to cause harm, right? And so Bob did a great job explaining his data set. <laughs> and so we can kind of skip over some of this, but the two things I really want to focus on here is that this is a sequence level analysis, whereas the previous literature on officer force has predominantly focused on average levels of forces or maximum levels of forces. Um, the argument we make in the paper is that this masks a lot of variability, almost what Bob was saying, right? Where things may start out relatively minor and then they escalate quickly, or things may start out uh, relatively serious and then uh, de-escalate, right? And so what this study really was meant to do in addition to studying threat was this idea of a sequence level approach, capturing that variability within incidents. And so uh, just as a visualization, we have a one incident. So incident number one may have three sequences. What we do in the study is we look at officer force here, here, and here, as well as subject resistance and their level of threat at each sequence, right? So it, this is a much more comprehensive examination of the idea of officer force. And then we directly compare it, right? Or, you know, we directly include like the incident number two, which has five sequences, right? And so we're actually able to model in some ways the kind of variations across the timing of incidents. Right, and so I'll explain this all in more detail. But the key thing I wanna say here is that for the sake of simplicity, in our main paper, we limited it to one subject resisting. And this is just more so to do with the fact that given the complexity of the analysis we were already doing, when you add in another subject and you have to kind of um, divvy up how force was being used and the multi-person like multi dynamics, um, we decided to kind of focus on the one subject incidents. Okay. And so our main thing that we're really trying to understand is at each sequence, what was the highest level of force that officers used? And as Bob showed, it goes from verbal exchange all the way down to deadly force. And so if in one sequence, someone used a, an officer used a verbal exchange, and then in the next one, they used a threat of force, we were able to track that. The independent variable of ability is the presence of a weapon or the officer's perception that a weapon was likely to be present, right? So before the use of force, was there a credible reason to suspect the subject had a weapon? And then we also took into account whether the subject actually did reveal or use a weapon at any point. And this has, um, this was one of the complex complexities in the paper because we wanted to really try and hone in on the perceptual process as much as we could. And so we used this to uh, create a combined measure, which is basically the subject wasn't believed to be armed with a weapon, and they didn't show any weapon. They were armed or believed to be armed with a firearm, 
and then they were armed with some other weapon, right, or believed to be armed. And the whole point here being that um, this is an incident level characteristic. So if the subject showed any type of weapon, they were coded as having ability. Okay, and then intent, I think this is one of the coolest parts of the paper, which is um, intent is hard to, it's kind of amorphous, right? Like, how do you measure intent? And so what we actually ended up doing is we looked at people's previous levels of resistance in the sequence or in the incident, right? So we have their level of resistance. And what we actually ended up doing is basically saying, okay, what did you do right beforehand? That's going to be your level of intent moving forward. Right. So it's kind of taking into this, uh, taking into account the sequential aspect of behavior. Um, right. And so someone who resisted a lot in the previous sequence, we assumed that officers would suspect they would continue resisting. And we kind of keep doing that, right? So resistance sequence one becomes intent in sequence two. Resistance at sequence two becomes intent in sequence three. And feel free to ask questions or anything like that, but I'm happy to answer them at the end too. And then opportunity, this is one of the novelties of another novelty of Bob's data set, which is it had information about how much control the officer had over the subject. So to what extent was the subject able to freely move around in the previous sequence? So we do something similar as we did with intent. And we take whether the subject had free movement all the way down to being hobbled, and we lag it one sequence. The key thing here is in this presentation, we show analyses from where I dichotomized it. Right. And so this is, again, for parsimony. And so it's basically saying that if a subject had free movement, um, if they were isolated or corner or they had a physical hold, um, they had opportunity to move about. But if they were pinned all the way down to hobble, they didn't have the opportunity. Right. And this is a simplification that we expand on in one of the supplemental analyses. Right. And again, this is lagged. Okay. So we also control for things, and it's just to basically be able to isolate the fact that not like resistance is not randomly distributed, right? So things like the number of officers is going to be related to the amount of force officers use and the amount of resistance subjects offer. Sex is a key correlate here, right? Where men are more likely to resist and they're more likely to have force used against them. Um, and then intoxication is kind of another measure of uh, like threat in some ways. Okay. And so basically to get to the results, the key part of the paper, um, I just want to say that we're going to start off with a visual visualization of some of those dynamic nature, uh, dynamic incidents that Bob was speaking about. And then I'll talk more about what is the relationship between threat and officer force. And so we're going to start with a visualization. So one of the things we did with the paper is to show the variability in officer force incidents. I computed visualizations for three incidents that had the same cumulative force factor. So if you had sequences, you had all the sequences, and you added up the force factors across each, um, what did officers use one level of force higher than the subject? Right. And so what we see here is this is the most common pathway in the data set overall for a plus one force factor. And so officers would start with a lawful command they'd escalate to physical control tactic, and then it'd end in three sequences with a physical strike or takedown. Compare this to what the subjects were doing at the same time, where they started off with passive resistance, then they plateaued at physical non-compliance. Right? And so from this kind of modal pathway, from this most typical pathway, we're seeing that things don't often escalate all the way to the most severe forms of resistance or the most severe forms of force, right? They're plateauing at this physical strike and physical non-compliance. So that's the, mode, that's the most common pathway. This is, if they were to go through all six sequences, you see a little bit more variability, but more often than not, it just has to do with, um, like it's just being more drawn out, right? I um, mean, it's really still hovering around this physical strike or takedown. So that's the modal pathway of six sequences, and this is the one with the greatest variability, right? So this is like the variability from going from sequence one to sequence two, right? So officers jump from a lawful command all the way up to less than lethal force, whereas uh, subjects went from non-compliance to verbal threat. And I would say that this is even a little misleading in some ways because, as we'll show in the next analysis, 
there's a lot of variability, right? Some of this incident, this modal pathway may be the fact that subjects were drinking, right? And this is not being captured in this resistance measure at the moment. And Andrew, yeah. I just wanted to jump in here and say something. So, so what I found in the in the data is that this um, lawful command jumping to less lethal, this is the most common thing that we see in a canine deployment. Mm -hmm. So you'll have multiple commands uh, to come out or we'll release the canine. Uh, the canine's uh, released, bites the suspect, and then that that that's the end. Um, so so obviously you have a quick escalation here in force, but um, you know you you don't tend to see a canine incident going on more than two sequences. Interesting. Right, and so that's something that you know could be accounted for, and it's right. It's kind of getting at. Uh, the relative course of powers of officers and subjects, right? So if you have access to a canine unit, how does that change your decision making, right? That's really interesting. Um, so this is showing variability across sequences within an incident. Most previous research hadn't really been able to do this because we didn't have that moment to moment um, data. And so then kind of seeing it visually, we wanted to look at it statistically, right? And so basically I can walk it through this, but what we see here is that if the subject was armed with a weapon, particularly a firearm, officers used more force against subjects. So if this was if they were armed with or believed to be armed with a weapon. So this is in line with the idea that threat is at least important in this sense. And then we also see support when we look at that measure of subject intent, right, and opportunity. So each of the three kind of theorized predictors show that if subjects have the ability, if they the greater intent they show, and if they have greater opportunity, the more likely officers are going to uh, use force, the higher the force that officers will use, right? And this is even after taking into account subjects resistance. So it's basically net of subject resistance, regardless of what subjects were actively doing to the officers or to resist arrest, these things were still correlated or still associated with officer force. Right. And so subjects who showed greater ability, greater intent and greater opportunity had more force used against them, which is in line with this idea of threat. Now, the key thing, though, here is that threat and especially ability, intent and opportunity, there's strong reasons to think that they probably depend on one another. Right. So if someone has a gun, that may be important. Right. It, you know, if you're in an open carry state or something like that. But what if you also show intent? Right. So let's say you're carrying a gun and you show some willingness to resist the officer or you have the freedom to do so. What does that look like when we add in this? It depends kind of point. And so this is what we looked at. Right. So what is the relationship between subject intent across subject opportunity? And what we see here is that intent, how much intent the subject shows matters more when they have the opportunity to continue resisting when they have the opportunity to continue resisting. That's this blue line here, right? So subjects who showed more intent had more force used against them when they had higher opportunities compared to subjects, even if they displayed the same amount of intent, but the officer had a like a good control over the situation. They had control over the subject, right? So this is suggesting, right, that the three dimensions, or at least these two dimensions are dependent on one another. You, they can't really be interpreted in isolation. So that's uh, intent and opportunity. We also find evidence for intent and ability, such that subjects who were armed with some other weapon, so not a firearm, or who were unarmed, when they show greater intent, officers used more force, right? So if you had no weapon or you had a knife, let's say, the more intent showed the higher level of force. When we look at the ones with firearms, though, we see something pretty different, where we actually see more of a horizontal line, where it doesn't matter how much intent subjects show, officers are going to use a similar level of force. Now, this seems kind of counterintuitive, right? Because firearms should be the highest level of ability in some way, and officers should use more force. Um, and in the paper, we kind of make the argument that, yeah, that's true in some ways, but it may be that the threat of a firearm or the threat of a belief of a firearm supersedes all other concerns, right? That ability means, Officers have to pay attention regardless of whether the subject has intent. So. And so, yeah, we see that with that blue line. 
All right, so basically summary of results, right? Ability, intent, and opportunity are all positively associated with force. This is consistent with the threat argument. Ability and opportunity interact with intent, where intent is associated with greater force, particularly when the subject has greater opportunity and when they're not armed with a firearm, right? And then resistance is positively associated with officer force, and it doesn't seem to kind of cancel out or completely account for the effects of threat. Right, so these are two, or what our results suggest is that these are two independent concepts um, that should be accounted for in our analyses. Now, that being said, this study is using official officer data based on their incident reports. What we'd like to do in future research is really hone in on those perceptual processes, right? Why do officers assume some subjects have greater threat than others, right? What are those signals that they rely on? Is it um, subtle movements and facial expressions, right? And then, or is it, you know, the physical size of a person, you know, things like that. What are those signals that officers use? And I think that's where we can really hone in on uh, understanding how threat is interpreted. And then do officers assess threat differently depending on the situation, right? So. If you're under a time pressure and you know, you're in these kind of situations where you have to respond very quickly, you may react differently. You may rely more on heuristics to understand threat. Or if it's more ambiguous, let's say it's at night and you don't have a clear picture of the subject, or if the subject, you can't accurately ascertain those signals of threat. Oh, sorry. Um, right? You don't actually understand, you, you don't know for certain if this person is a threat or not, are you willing to take that risk? And then one of the things I want to explore a lot is this idea of personal experiences. If I've been on the job for several years and I've had several experiences with like you know high intense situations, how does that change my understanding of the signals of threat? And I think this is where a lot of the like subjectiveness of threat perception comes into play, right? So it doesn't officer early in their career interpret threat differently and have different kind of cost benefit equations than an officer later in their career. And then really, how does the assessment change throughout the situation? And so I think from like a canine perspective or just in general use of force, one of the things I really want to explore is, let's say I assess the subject have, as having a lot of threat, but I get information that is counter to that as I interact with them. So let's say I think the person has a gun, three sequences go by, I don't see any evidence of a gun, how do I update my assessment in that situation, right? Am I resistant to change, right? Is it like a confirmation bias type thing? What are the processes underlying these moment to moment uh, threat perceptions? And then one last thing, because I think this is a really cool part of the paper. Um, because we had to use Bob's, uh, because we use Bob's data set, which is based on incident reports, and that's the best data we had, we still faced criticisms of what if officers were inaccurate, right? What if they misreported the behavior in the police reports? And it may be that they misremembered, you know, a number of other reasons. And so as a supplemental analysis, we basically simulated or we examined what would happen if officers were wrong or misreported their information by so much, right? So what if officers reported physical resistance when in reality subjects only verbally resisted? You know, and so we kind of did some make believe, you know, simulation type stuff. And we found that our res results and the relationship between subject threat and force would still maintain, right? So this coefficient is still above zero. Um, but this is something I'd really like to explore more, which is this idea of uh, what is accurate reporting, right? And incident reports, All right? So thank you very much. You know, thank you for the opportunity. And John, feel free to add anything. Sure. Am I working now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I usually use this thing for uh, Teams meetings and it works like a champ, but Google Meet, it doesn't play nicely, I guess. Um, I thought I would just really quickly put some of this in context. Um, this kind of research, while it's uh, connected to, to the real world and actual uh, police use of force, it's also uh, somewhat academic. So it's not, you know, necessarily a, a policy evaluation or, or what works in in terms of de-escalation or, or resolving force quickly uh, on the one hand, and it's not a pure academic exercise on the other. It kind of straddles uh, 
the middle ground here. And so what the impetus for this is, is a whole bunch of use of force research that's been published over the years. And almost uniformly, it looks at resistance uh, as a predictor of force uh, while controlling for some other uh, variables like we, we showed in this presentation. And so um, not too long ago, uh, uh, some other scholars basically argued that uh, the focus on resistance is inconsistent with the law and it doesn't honor the Graham versus Connor standard. And we have to look essentially at the totality of circumstances, which would also include threat besides just resistance. So this study attempts to, to put that sort of theory or that argument that they uh, presented to the test. Uh, so that's, that's kind of cutting edge in that sense. And while it may not be uber exciting to those out there in the trenches, from an academic standpoint, and theory testing uh, standpoint, it very much is, is novel. And, and it shows that, yes, indeed, there's more to it than just resistance. There's, there's these different dimensions of threat that need to be accounted for. They, they exist uh, and are affecting force outcomes, and they need to be accounted for in deciding what is and isn't. Uh, proper use of force. So that's that's just a little context and, and historical background. And uh, I've been here at UTD since 2006 and I've been doing policing research uh, pretty much that whole time, actually, uh, even before that, uh, but more recently uh, into the use of force space. And I got connected with Bob a few years ago. And then when Andrew came on here at UTD recently, we uh, started to team up. I think we uh, play off each other nicely and, and that's uh, the background. So thanks for having us. I have a question. In Andrew's presentation, he I noticed that he had the police canine where he jumped from a, uh, a relatively small status, right jumped five levels up into something more aggressive. Do you know, are you tracking why he would do that? Why they do that? I think... I think I can add something to that, a kind of pile onto your question once you get the answer too. So Andrew, go oh, ahead. Yeah. I, don't, I don't have a camera anymore. My camera died. Okay. No, you're good. So one of the things I want to say, uh, clarify here is I didn't actually make any separate stipulations if it's a canine unit or not, right? It's just that's what the trend or that's kind of what the level of force would be, um, Bob was saying. One of the things I would say in terms of kind of the qualitative aspects that you're asking for, um, we have it quantified. And so one of the things I think that would be a really cool kind of future research study is to explain that variability. Right now, we didn't address that in this question, right? Is So what explains why officers make such great departures? Um, but Bob can maybe expand a little more on the qualitative stuff and if that's available in the data. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I just pointed that out because that that's the, the typical scenario that I've seen in body cam videos and just and just reviewing the reports is that when a decision is made to deploy a canine, it's almost always the same because that the, you know they they you know oftentimes these may be individuals that that are you know hiding in a house or hiding in the bushes they've already fled they refuse to come out the police generally know where they are but rather than go in themselves and try to apprehend the suspect they send in the dog and so so that type of scenario which is pretty common for canines produces based on our coding system produces that jump from a, 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 a command to a, a less lethal weapon, which you typically don't see in other types of force. So physical force and tasers and everything, usually there's there are, are other things going on before you make that jump. So it's really a function a lot of, of, of how we code it. Um, uh, because you know you could you could say well maybe canine should be higher or lower than other less lethal and so forth, but it's just a typical scenario. So that's why we that's why I pointed that out because we 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 typically see that it's not we're not trying to make a judgment call about whether it's good or bad. It's just that this is what we we see. Go ahead, Steve. Okay. Um, well, I think that um, you this is where there may be a gap in what the study was able to accomplish and an extension may be able to do this because um, there's a difference between threat and risk. Mm -hmm. And and I think that um, 
risk is attendant to circumstances beyond just what you can articulate in threat as you've defined it. And I think you've done a good job defining threat. And I think the sequencing model makes sense. And in fact, your sequencing model has been documented as far back as 1972. Mm -hmm. If you saw the movie, The New Centurions way back then, you listened to George C. Scott tell Stacy Keach Kilvinsky's law, which is if they use their fist, you use your stick. If they use a knife, you use your gun. And that basically it the the route to coming out of use of force events is suspect resistance plus one. Just what it takes to to end the fight and the struggle. So that being said, there are times when risk is a factor that needs to be considered. And that's where building searches, as Bob, you described it. If you're standing outside a building giving a bunch of warnings for someone to come out and they don't come out, well, you've done this attempt at verbal compliance. And then you put the dog in, the dog finds somebody hiding, the dog seizes that person. Well, now you have a less lethal application skipping all those things along the way. And that is because uh, in large part, society places a higher value on human life than it does on dog life. And so we allow dogs to absorb risk that we would be hesitant to have officers go sticking their head in every nook and cranny in that building, putting themselves at risk. And going back to Robinette versus Barnes, you'll find case law to support that notion that building searches are considered risky. The other, other circumstance in which a dog is likely to um, jump, make that jump from verbal commands to that is when you have a fleeing suspect, somebody who is running. And at that point, the dog's superior speed and ability to adjust flight once launched toward the target, unlike um, unlike a firearm, unlike a taser, unlike a blue nose, et cetera, it gives the dog an advantage there. So we're trying to leverage the dog's advantages in those circumstances. And I think um, that being said, where do you see if your extension, if you if you if there is an extension to this research that's done, do you see a way to uh, to to quantify risk in the manner that you have with threat and and that you have with resistance in the way that we can we can take a look at it because there are factors um, that I think go into officers' uh, decision making. In fact, the environment in which you're working, I can make a traffic stop on somebody I know is a problem. Um, in one part of town and that's fine but i know if i'm in another like if i'm at a, a specific intersection i'm right in front of that person's whole family and i know at that point i that stop is riskier than one that is done in a different location because that individual has the ability to marshal forces against me very quickly and it's happened in pl plenty of times so where does that ball run yeah, I, I, you make a, a, a fantastic point, Steve, about the, about the risk assessment, and 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 the way that I, I sort of think about it is that is that like I'm trying to think maybe maybe a third of the agencies that that uh, use our data system have canine units, mm -hmm. and there's a wide range in how those agencies use their canines. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean. <laughs> I mean, we had, we had, um, I mean, not so much anymore, but uh, Spokane PD, uh, when, I mean, they, they, uh, 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 they, they had for, for eight years, we had, we had eight years of data and 25% of all their use of force were canine bites. Um, and then we had other agencies that had actually larger, more canines, larger canine units. And you know, less than five percent of their use of force were canine bites, and so it really is a function of policy. And your policy is going to be looking at that risk because if you if you don't have a canine unit and you have a person in a warehouse that's hiding that you're trying to find, and you don't have a canine unit, then you're eventually going to go in, right, the officers, and try to find that mm -hmm. suspect. And, and, but if you have a canine unit, then you evaluate, you know, based on your own policies and your own checklists, right? Okay, this meets our, our policy requirements for sending in the canine. And just like you said, Steve, I mean, the canine is, is viewed as more expendable than an officer. And, and so you can, you can send that dog in there so to avoid injuries or, or risk to the officers. And so, so that's a really, 
uh, I mean, interesting point, but I don't, it's it, one of the things that's hard about um, uh, collecting data on that is that it's going to be so policy specific uh, because there is no sort of general, you know, risk standard. Um, and so, so different agencies, even with canine units, will look at risk in different ways. And so, so I don't know how to quantify that um, from the way that we extract data from, uh, but it's certainly something that could be like a specialized, you know, a study, just looking at canines and how, how agencies assess risk when, when determining when to send in their canine officers. Yeah, and just to kind of add on to that, in order to quantify that risk, one thing that I've been looking into a lot is doing like an original data collection where you provide like two different scenarios um, with different levels of threat potential, right? So manipulating the ability, opportunity, and intent, and having participants, potentially officers, basically evaluate which one is more dangerous, right? Which one is more threatening? So we can actually, and you know, pinpointing what is risky or what is dangerous about that situation and how would they respond. And so that's more of a hypothetical kind of contrived example compared to actual police force data. Um, but it's some way of getting at that mechanism of how much is threat about, or, you know, adding to the risk. Yeah, it's a great point. Scott? Let me unmute here. Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. That was, uh, that was great. Um, I think there's a lot of use for, for the data that you have um, in a lot of different ways for agencies to take a look at, at you know, force in any different way is a good way for, you know, uh, to try to help uh, bring about change, positive, positive change down the road and keep cops out of trouble, which is really one of the important things. Uh, but I just want to um, piggyback on something Bill Lewis said and what Steve said. When just th these actually just be, you know, um, I know a lot of your process is to constantly be in, be be bringing in um, interpretations and, you know, insight into improving your processes, but coming up with standardized definitions because the information you're getting across the country is so subjective. Every state is different. Every uh, every um, policy is different. <clears throat> There's a difference. So, for example, um, and I, I'm not sure, you know, how much you you did go into this or if you have it uh, uh, set out. But even the difference between um, substantial injury or significant injury or significant crime or whatever, from a suspect to an officer under the law, under let's say an assault with a deadly weapon, compared to what force is defined as. Uh, maybe causing serious bodily injury to a suspect, they're different. They're different. So you, if you use just a Black's Law definition, definition for police work in the different levels of force, it comes out, the formula comes out different. And I don't know if that makes sense, but if you look at like a, take one policy and look at it, you'll see like the way things are defined and and that's one of the one of the things that comes up is well the guy did this and therefore the cop caused serious bodily injury. It's like well that's not the way it works. It's not an ADW. When we use force against somebody under the color of law and authority, it's different from when they use it against us. Type of it. That's kind of what I'm, what I'm saying is that the definitions are are important to interpreting data. So it's just something to keep in mind um, because yeah, it isn't important and every law is just completely different across, across the country. The other thing uh, with regards to canine that Steve talked about, the couple of things to keep in mind as you move forward, if you do a focus on canine, is there is a big difference between the, making the, the officer making the decision to deploy the dog to locate a criminal suspect where the officer is making the decision to deploy based on criteria versus the the officer making the decision to use the dog as a use of force so you're you're saying canine is considered non non-lethal or, or less lethal um i'm assuming you're combining agencies that divide non-lethal and less lethal and less than lethal all as less lethal but that would be another good definition point is hey we're combining non-lethal, less lethal, or we're combining it as tools, 
devices is just such a different array of the way things are defined across the country. Um, Non-lethal or le less lethal, less than lethal. Sometimes they're completely different things when you can just combine them. Intermediary force, non-lethal non force. There's all these definitions. So as long as the, d the data will come out clean if you're, if you're applying standardized definitions. Um, so if someone says, hey, um, using a particular force in my agency is non-lethal or um, um, de minimis force. How is it coming out at the other end? And it's going to be well it's standardized because we have interpreted those, those definitions are all combined to create this level of force in our, our decision making, our decision point. But the other thing, the last thing, I'll just leave you with, with this, is just, a, a, I think this is great data. It's great information to use, and it's a great source for a lot of um, more, more studies and a place to, certainly a place to start to help, help cops. But the other thing is when just the, the, the um, issue of the cop making the decision versus, you know, there's no other way to say it, the dog making the decision. You are intending that that guy is going to get bit and go to jail and he's running down the street. The officer makes the decision to deploy under Graham. It's an analysis for the decision making analysis for the use of force. But if you're just searching for the suspect, guy, uh, guy goes around the dumpster, you send the dog. You really don't know what you're going to what you're going to find. He's up in a up in a rafter in a dumpster. He goes into an alert. You locate the guy and arrest him. There's no use of there's no use of force or the guy's climbing out of the dumpster and gets bitten. You're considering those, I'm assuming, as the same level of force, even though the officer didn't directly have the decision to use the force, which would infer that every deployment requires the decision to use that you're using force when most canine policies don't. Most canine policies are you get there, you use your criteria, you use the dog to search. The fact that the guy gets bitten is a secondary consideration. So I'm sorry to ramble. I just kind of was making some notes, but uh, that's all I, I had. But I, I think this is great data. I think you guys did a great job of, of, uh, of putting it together and presenting it. And I look forward to reading more of, the, more of your stuff. So thanks. So if I, if I could just respond to a few, a few comments that, that I remember and let me know if I don't hit everything. So, so that, that is the biggest challenge uh, I found in, in analyzing use of force data is that every agency is different. Mm. Every agency has their own policies. Every agency has their own training programs. Um, some agencies, for example, count the pointing of a firearm or a taser as a use of force yeah. and, and other agencies don't. And so some agencies count very low levels of physical force, you know, anything, you know, like even a little bit of resisted handcuffing, you know, they'll count as a use of force and other agencies may only count higher levels of physical force or only if there's an injury. So we do as best we can to, to, so for example, if an agency reports, um, uh, and we only see use of force, right? So we don't see canine deployments where there's no bite. Right. So we are only looking at that subset of canine deployments where the dog bit, regardless of why they were sent in. Um, and so it's a relatively small uh, uh, portion. And so so and, and for things like pointing of a firearm, we don't we don't analyze those together. If an agency wants us to 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 collect data on their pointing of a firearm, we analyze those completely separately from actual use of force incidents. The other thing is, is that some agencies have a policy, like there are a lot of agencies in what, like tasers are very big in Washington state. Um, and some agencies actually have a policy that on your use of force continuum, the taser is the lowest level of force. So officers are just going to their taser first thing. Um, and, um, and, and other agencies have very restrictive policies on, on, on weapons. And so, so we tried to, uh, sort of simplify the use of force continuum. So, so we actually do group all less lethal weapons, anything that's not a firearm I, 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 into one category. Uh, and then uh, also, we don't, I don't think I've ever seen this, but if, if an officer used a less lethal weapon in a lethal manner, then we would code that as lethal force. So if, a sus if an officer was hitting the suspect in the head with a baton, then we would code that as a lethal force. But those are pretty rare if ever. Um, so that's so. So you're right about the the challenges, but we've tried as best we can to standardize that, um, and I think we've done a pretty good job. And we actually have comparative dashboards 
that we give to agencies so that they can compare their use of force practices to, to other agencies. And you can really see from these comparative dashboards how your policies and training make a huge difference in how your officers are using force. We did a we did a project in Dane County, Wisconsin, where Madison is, where where 16 agencies, and they all use the same training facility, uh, and they focused heavily on martial arts. Um, and so all the officers in the county were trained pretty well in martial arts, and they almost no agency. Uh, almost every it used a weapon. I mean, it was almost all physical force. Um, whereas in California, they they still uh, use quite uh, not not a lot, but but uh, batons and so a lot of physical strikes in California. And I think that's a function of just the training academies and so forth. So so all these factors are going to come into play. But we have, you know, we do the best we can trying to standardize uh, a, a very you know, sort of disparate data set. Lou. So Bob, John, and Andrew, thank you very much for your research and for presenting this to us. Bob, your opening slide or one of your opening slides caught me completely by surprise when you estimated the annual canine bites between 15,000 and 25,000 bites. Uh, and the reason why that surprises me is because even the anti-police dog groups are only using 3,600 uh, bites per year. And they're basing that off of emergency room visits off of an eight-year study. Mm -hmm. And assuming that uh, almost all police policy requires an emergency room visit based upon a canine, meaning that the police mm -hmm. officer is forced to uh, get that person to at least have a, an exam at the emergency room, I'm wondering if that 3,600 isn't a better number than your small sample. And the, and the reason why I'm saying that is because, well, you, you're presenting this now. It's going to go public at some point, if not now, if later, or somebody might even be watching this. And they're going to put out the 15,000 to 25,000, citing you as the expert that's coming up with this number. And that's going to greatly skew the 3,600 number of that eight year study. And I didn't, I just wanted to point that out because. That's going to change my narrative significantly if that becomes uh, the fact pattern uh, for these anti-police dog groups. Yeah, I, I, and, and I actually, I actually did that just before the webinar. I, I've never. This isn't in the in the paper we published. I, I I tried to put in something relevant for for the webinar because we were obviously talking to the canine group, but but the the. Um, I would never, I mean, I only present that for you. I know it's on the webinar and everything, but that's not, and I tried to do as many caveats as I can. I mean, that is a super rough estimate, you know, based on, I mean, all of those numbers on that, on that uh, uh, chart were, were, were rough estimates, but it, it's based on the, um, and, and also to, to comparing it with the, the, the emergency room visits, um, we find that um, there are, you know, even though the injury rate is quite high for canine bites, there are obviously the canine can bite, you know, through thick clothing. Uh, there, there may not be um, a, a need to go to the emergency room. They may be, uh, you know, treated by EMTs. Um, so we're seeing, you know, uh, more cases than would be in the emergency rooms. And that's why I was asking, you know, or sort of earlier on, does this, does this number sound right? Because it is really a guesstimate. And and um, uh, so it's certainly nothing I would put out there as oh this is this is the actual number or anything it was s specifically for this group so thanks for thanks for pointing that out and uh, hopefully this 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 uh, disclaimer will will help as well. Awesome, thank you, Bob, very very much. Mr. Lewis, thanks, Don. Um, great presentation. One of the things that really caught my attention right off the bat was the uh, justification analysis and assigning numbers to a specific incident. Um, I'm very concerned about that. Uh, I'd love to hear Gene's thoughts, but um, to me, if you start assigning numbers to justify the use of force, we become very subjective in our numbers of what is 15 and 14 um 
And for me personally, having defended officers, I really am in the justified or not category. Um, because I think when you start assigning these levels of fours and looking at your chart breakdown that what justifies the high level or the medium level, I think we're, I think we're getting into trouble there. And um, I could just see a plaintiff's attorney using the numbers uh, over a, a handler's career of, well, what's the 17s here and what's the sixes there? Um, so that stood out to me as well. Going back to what Scott also mentioned too, I really, I think definitions are extremely important to clarify what it is. The other thing too that you touched on was a canine bite. And a canine bite as a level of force, again, is a very subjective uh, term that we use because canine bites vary. They vary from deadly force to requiring a Band-Aid and being kicked out of the hospital. And so we can't always just establish the level of force of a canine bite by simply that, that simple term of a canine bite. That's all. Thanks. Yeah, and just just to respond to that. So, so our our system is not; it never has been, and I don't think it ever ever will be used. You know, the numbers in in court, right? That that's not what the system is designed to do. The system does not change. Every every case that we get has already been evalu reviewed and evaluated by the department, and they've looked at their own policies and made a determination of whether or not a particular use of force incident is in or out of policy. We can get cases that were found out of policy that have a good justification score, and we can have you know cases with a low justification score that are found to be within policy. All we're doing is we're saying we need a standardized way of looking at use of force across all agencies, and we're going to base it on the Graham v. Connor standard. It gives it gives each agency a relative risk score, so that they can start to look internally um, uh, uh, about how their officers are using force. And if they see something they don't like, or they see officers that are doing exactly what they want, and other officers that are slightly off, then they can make adjustments uh, there. And we're very clear about. We never make a determination about, okay, anything with a four or below is unjustified. All we're saying is, is that, you know, and, and, and we don't, because we're not making a value judgment, right? We're not saying this is, the, we're, not, we're not making any legal determinations about the data. We're simply saying, this is how we code the data. These are the numbers that we get. And what I found is that um, agencies find it extremely helpful. And not only do they find it helpful, but it enables the agency to really educate and inform elected officials and the community about what's actually happening. Because the narrative, obviously, from the, from the police activists and so forth and the media is that, is that all use of force is bad, right? And we want to reduce use of force to zero if possible. And, and that's never going to happen because you're always going to have a certain number of people that are going to resist or flee or threaten the officers. And so being able to quantify that and say, you know, well, 4%, you're, you're really, it's really hard to get below 4% on your arrest rate for use of force because some people just won't comply. And what are you supposed to do? Just let them run away. And then if you did that, then everybody's going to run away. So, so this, this system really helps to educate people about what is actually happening instead of what people think is happening. Gene. Good afternoon. I have COVID, so it sounds like I have a bad cold, but I didn't want to miss this because I really enjoyed it. I see Bill's concern because I don't like numerical quantifiers. I know in our SWAT world, when we have a high risk search warrant threat matrix, some agencies like to use numbers and if it's a 10 or above or whatever, they'll use a full blown SWAT team. I prefer yes or no to a series of questions. But I think Bill, if this is limited to an administrative review and enable agencies to be able to determine where our use of force is going, how can we increase our use of force training and a review process? Uh, I think that is a separate category. Again, I hope, uh, Andrew, Bob, and John never get subpoenaed by plaintiff's attorneys uh, to work with them like Jeffrey Alpert does. I know he assists the plaintiff's attorneys, and I have a problem with his statistics uh, in some of the articles that he has written. Um, 
I was concerned, like many, with the number of estimates of canines. Uh, I represent two two of the largest units in the country, LAPD and LA County. And we even when we had a class action against LAPD many years ago, over a three year period of time, I think there was only a hundred people that were uh, thought to have been bitten over that period of time. So that does concern me. Um, just anecdotally from the units that I represent, uh, in their wildest dreams, they couldn't make that average. So that was one of my concerns. So hopefully it was just a very rough estimate. But I think, uh, and Bill, you're right. I only argue in court is either justifiable under Graham versus Connor. I don't even argue whether our dogs are trained under a guard and bark or a find and bite philosophy, because that's irrelevant. It's training philosophy. Um, but the other issue that comes up is, um, just lost my train of thought there, but otherwise I thought, as long as it stays in the administrative review process, I'm good with that. And that's what it sounds like this was really meant for. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Bob. This isn't saying that cops are using too much force or that we're misusing our dogs in certain circumstances. You just came up with a process where we can try to help the department learn where the force is coming where can we possibly increase our training and what seem to be indicators that our officers should be aware of before we use any kind of force that's the way i kind of took it i may be wrong yeah no you're you're exactly right and, and the thing to to bear in mind is that no agency has or ever would use our system for disciplinary purposes uh and and and, and the the our systems never like nobody's ever looked at the numbers in our system and and changed a finding on on whether force was justified or not. That's that's not what the system. It's really designed for for policies, for training, for for education uh, of of public and elected officials, and and to allow the department to basically answer any question that anyone might have about their use of force. Um, and and the other thing about the the uh, the, the canine estimates, uh, I'm really glad that, that, that you all have, have pointed this out, but I'm not going to, to share, to ever do that again, <laughs> because, because I, I literally, it was just a, a, a back of the napkin, you know, oh, I'll just, I'll just see, you know, based because, because, you know, it's, it's based on a sample of a hundred agencies, not all of which have canine units and some of which use canines a lot. Uh, and I just took that 400,000 number, which is also a very rough estimate, and and took that percentage. That's how I came up with the number. So don't worry, I'm not, I'm not, there's no, there's very little basis for that number. So it's not going anywhere beyond this webinar. My follow-up, Bob, and I just remembered it, is you did analysis of Graham versus Connor, which is what we all do. However, Perth and some other agencies are now adopting a standard higher than Graham. It's the proportionality necessity de-escalation standard. And I'm mm. curious under your process, how you would review uses of force if we were to use that standard. I know, I think Denver's gone there, Maryland's gone there, Illinois has gone there, LAPD has gone there and some other agencies as well. Yeah, and I, I wouldn't do it. The only thing that I would do is if 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 there was a a, a Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court decision that raised the Graham standard, then we would have to adjust there. But there, there's just too many different standards that are out there. So we have to use the, the, the floor, right? Nothing can go below Graham. So that's what we'll use. Um, and, and it seems to work pretty, pretty well. I mean, we don't, I mean, and, and, and one thing that's interesting is that every, every agency is going to have, um, you know, incidents that are in the in the lower justification range, and and, and it can be like fifteen to twenty percent of all their use of force, and that in and of itself is not a problem, as long as the force factor is not super high, because these are cases where you know a suspect you know may just be refusing to put their hands behind their back, and so the officer has to use a very low level of force. So the, so the justification for that may be, may be low based on our criteria, because it might not be a serious crime, they're not fleeing, they're not threatening, and so forth, they're not resisting very much. But if, if you have a low justification score and a high force factor score, so if somebody's just refusing to put their hands behind their back and you tase them, or you, or you release the canine and they bite them, then that's a low justification and a high force factor, that is a concern. Because it's like, why did you use overwhelming force 
uh, against a suspect with low level of resistance and the, the justification is very low. So, so we can really fine tune all these different metrics um, to, to really analyze your, your highest risk cases. Um, and, and that's, that's really what, what it's designed to do. And Bob, let me just kind of, one of the things that I felt whenever you first introduced me to the system is also the time element, right? So you can see changes in the distribution of your numbers, right? So it's not about any one particular incident, right? It's seeing, you know, you kind of get the, the whole forest, I guess, right? So you can see that. So I think that's useful too. The, the other thing I wanted to point out is that the, the, one of the great things about our system is that you can quickly identify your highest performing mm -hmm. officers. Like you can really know, oh, this officer knows how to use force mm -hmm. because they go, they go in at the right time with the right level of force. They resolve the case quickly. You don't have to have 10 officers piling on. And so, so you can really, agencies can really use the system to fine tune their use of force so that it is the most effective and least harmful. Um, and that's really what it's designed to improve rather than to identify, you know, oh, this is a bad, a bad officer or bad incident. Thanks, guys. Anybody have anything else? Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. Awesome, guys. Thank you. Super. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Take thank care. you. Yep. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye.